Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about super continuum lasers. So let's dive deep into it. So what exactly is laser itself? Well, laser is narrow band by its own nature, meaning whenever you buy a laser and you go lol with it, it generally simply means it's a narrow band, meaning all the energy is focused into very narrow spectrum, whatever spectrum that could, whatever wavelength it could be, it could be uh, basically blue, green, red, whatever have you, or infrared, so uh, it could be whatever you want, but it generally would be narrow band, and it would be so narrow band, it would be classified as monochromatic, meaning if you try to expose it into colors, it will be like to just one color. So that's by nature, like uh, how lasing works, more or less that will always happen. Then we have directional, even without optics. For example, many times you see uh, lenses in lasers and all that jazz. They are there to improve the quality of the beam. Uh, laser, even if you just take the diode itself, like actual silicon laser diode, it itself will give you a laser beam. It's just the quality would be sloppy. So directionality would be there even without uh, basically optics, meaning the nature itself, the coherent nature itself is creating the beam. The optics is there to refine it. Then you have coherent itself, meaning if you take the, you can do many experiments with this and this actually allows you to uh, do much higher communication uh, because it's again coherent and not just waves are coming at random time. So it's very, very tight beam. So these things are inherent to nature, uh, laser itself, monogrammatic, directional and coherent. It's like fundamental physical properties. But what if you need color? And here's the deal. Color, I mean, as in not just like you take three colors and mix them and claim into be white. Like that's how your uh, laser IMAX projector was. They have like three diodes, uh, red, blue, and green. Now, why do they only need three? Well, here's the deal. The digital file only has three, the red, blue, green. Some uh, do go with uh, yellow, but again, I have not seen any actual reason for that, but you get the point. Like if your camera sensor is only capturing three channels, red, blue, and green, to recreate it, you only need three channels. So three to three, done. But if you need color, true color, meaning if you put a shine into something and it actually looks like a continuous system, you need color. You do not need mixing of this, you need color. You need wide band. So this is how we discovered super continuum. Now let this be very clear. This was a discovered phenomena. I have linked the gentleman who actually discovered it down below. And uh, they were shocked to be frank. And uh, it's very interesting to hear their stories. Like they were like, what the hell is happening? How the heck? And be mindful, this is the era of negatives, film developments and all that. And they were like, you know, uh, something must be broken, something there's light leaks and they were like taping them because it did not make sense. How the heck laser can have all the properties of the laser and be wideband? How the heck that happened? Well, it was discovered and turns out you can make a laser that is wideband, meaning it has all the colors. Now, be mindful. Uh, this is why the field is so young. The name, nomenclature is not very solid, so to say. It simply means wideband. Nothing about color. It's just wideband. You can do that with infrared, meaning if you have infrared cutting laser, metal cutting laser, it will be very, very narrow band. You want a narrow band. But what if you want, for some reason, for let's say spectroscopy, you need uh, like wideband. You can still do super continuum. It will still be infrared, but it will be much wider. So. That's what it means whenever you are talking about super continuum. You're taking a very narrow vent, stretch it. Generally, we are talking about uh, stretching uh, basically a monochromatic into color spectrum, but that's what we, it means. Basically taking a narrow, stretching it. And you take pump laser beam. It's exactly like a fiber laser. Instead of lasing, some other effects are happening here. And it just takes the fiber, takes the laser source and broadens it. Meaning you take the peak and you just stretch it. How the heck that happens? Well, this is where it gets into actual quantum physics, meaning the things that are happening in there, it's so complex, so high level that, uh, by the way, people got Nobel Prize to figure it out. That's how complex these things are. So it has self-phase modulation. I have no idea what it is. Four wave mixing. Apparently you take uh, like two pumped out and randomly two other colors comes out. And then you have simultaneous Raman scattering where you have two going in and something else will come out. And then you have cross phase modulation XPM. Be mindful, people have to spend whole PhDs just to understand one of these things. So many things are happening. That's why it's classified as a collection of non-linear processes. Like we can control it to some extent, but we do not have like full uh, fine-tuned control over it. Like all these things are happening. And uh, Stellon fusion and Stellon self uh, frequency shift. So basically you can put monochromatic in and broadening will happen. So it's a really complex system. Fundamentally speaking, it's genuinely complex and it's very recent. So all these aspects are not very, what you will define, where it's like, no, this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. It's not there yet. 
So how the heck we make it? Well, you start with a pulse laser. This is a very uh, critical aspect. I have not seen any system where you can use a, a continuous laser. It's uh, not like fiber where you have the choice. Either you can use pumped as a seed laser or you can use uh, basically continuous if you want cutting laser. Here it is pumped. It's like it always requires pumped laser. Now be mindful, pumped for laser point of view, not for your point of view. It could be like a femtosecond laser, which would be firing at let's say hundreds of hertz. You will see a continuous beam, but the laser itself is always pulsed. Like I have not seen even single paper and all the people who have successfully recreated it, they always used pulsed laser. The laser source is always pulsed. So you have peak wavelength, and then this puppy is sent into fiber. Now fiber is the magic part here. Instead of lasing in the fiber, it is doing all the Raman scrattering and all that jazz. So that's how you are broadening it. You are inputting a very narrow band and you are stretching that puppy to making it wide band. So it works, everything is awesome, but it is very low efficiency. Meaning if you think 10, 20% efficiency of a normal laser is bad and like best case scenario of 30 to 50% efficiency of fiber laser is bad, this puppy is even worse. Like genuinely the efficiency on this puppies are bad. Like it was a big deal few years ago that we finally have 10 watt laser. Now then it became like, finally we have 20 watt laser. So be mindful, this puppy is very inefficient. Now, R&D on this field is still ongoing. Let this be very clear. This is very recent, as recent as it's gonna be. So we have fiber and fiber, we are working on it. Like which fiber works? Some people have used hollow fiber. Some people have used normal uh, communication fiber. Yes, as in like, just buy a normal fiber and use it and somehow it works. I have linked a video down below of an individual YouTuber who figured it out in his household. So it does work. It's just that it's very um, complex, so to say. Hollow fibers with shapes, be mindful, this is cylindrical, some have hexagonal ports into it, different companies are trying with different mix. Uh, so, very basically you take a pulse laser, focus it into a fiber, fiber has to be long, let that be very clear. This is one thing that is very linear about it. The quality directly goes up the longer the fiber becomes. It's like you really want a long ass fiber. Like start with 10, 20 meters and go up to 100 meters or maybe even uh, 20 uh, meters and something like that or even long, more than that. So this is how it works. You pump it and the uh, fiber does its magic and you get continuous, continuous out. Let this be very clear. This is why it's so interesting. It's continuous. It's not like, you know, red, blue, green sent through a prism and it like splits into three again. No, it's continuous. So if you use this light for spectroscopy, it is going to give you precise detail. So this is how it works. Are there any uses of this puppy? Well, yes. Uh, this literally allowed optical microscope to become important again. Like why? Well, opti optical microscope have a limitation. Like a wavelength has a fundamental limitation. Like we know for a fact how far an optical glass can go. But here's the deal. We never actually managed to reach that point. Like you can buy a camera lens and you can know that fact. Like it's supposed to be that sharp, but it's realistically not that sharp. Why? Well, light itself is messy. But what happens if you are uh, using a microscope, optical microscope, but the light source is a laser? And a broad, not does, you cannot do that with a, you know, RGB because that will look ugly AF. So if you have a continuous smooth broadband, now you can expose things that are far more difficult. Now you can focus the light on such a small area that resolution, the actual resolution, the MTF of the optical system is exponentially better. So it will be literally like going from one megapixel to 10 megapixel. So optical microscopes are now like, whoa. Biological research, whoa. Dial research, whoa. Like many things can be done with optical. Which was like a few years ago, people would have not believed you. Now they're like, holy damn, optical is giving you this clarity? Yes. Because again, you physically cannot focus a incoherent light. It inherently is not coherent. So if you have laser that is coherent and has all the wavelengths, it's smooth, it's coherent, it just goes through optics, goes very precisely through optics, outcome is very precise rendering and output is awesome. Then you have spectroscopy. This is like, NASA is like, shut up, take money. Medicine industry, shut up, take money. You have a very smooth wavelength and be mindful, it's not necessary that it could be just uh, color. It could go from very low into infrared to very high in ultraviolet. And some lasers, yes, they are so stupid that I actually have that range. Where it's like, it's almost hyperspectral at that point. Where it's like from um, mid infrared to high ultraviolet. And benefit of that is if you take that and you expose it to any compound, compound specifically, it will give you a very clear signature what the heck I am. So from medicine point of view, they went from like having multiple spectroscopy with a different different laser sources to one shut up, take money, go home. So spectroscopy needs this. And be mindful, spectroscopy is this, this is almost similar thing that you see in the Mars rover. So spectroscopy, if you really want to do proper spectroscopy, this sort of system is like shut up, take money. 
then we have optical fiber characterization because be mindful you cannot make an optical fiber that is just like magic it's just like light goes in light goes out at the other end that's not how it works it will be very transparent in some wavelength it will be sloppy in others how would you test it well you can try incandescent bulb and it will give you the most smooth uh, spectrum out there but problem would be it would be very hard to couple to a fiber However, you can use this and then it's like, okay, it's laser to laser. So properties are literally well matching to what it will be in the field. So this is very necessary and optical fiber is important to our day to day life. So having a better technology to test it, good. Frequency comb. Now this is a magic level technology, which uh, again, very complex, but understand it this way. Why do we have GPS? Because GPS have atomic clock. How do those atomic clocks are accurate? Because they have frequency comb. Frequency comb, love this. They like take this and mix it into spiky, spiky things and amazing things can be done with that. Like very idiotically precise time clocks can be made with that. And optical communication. Now that's the most odd part I have found because it does not make sense. The same way like you do not want a white light source in your projector because if you have white light source, you will split it into three again. So might as well have three independent source because be mindful camera, digital camera itself is doing that. So once you have lost that data, there is no point recreating yellow channel or Hululu channel or Jingalala channel. You can do that, it's just no point. So optical communication I generally do not get is like how the heck they're doing that. Like is there some technology that allows you to have a fiber and selectively turn off red of it, selectively turn off blue of it if you have a continuous source. I do not know, but I've seen way too many papers, but none of them actually showed what exactly it's doing. It's confusing to me. Again, I, I do expect some solution to be there, but I have not found it yet. So what we can expect in the future? Well, be mindful, this field is very new and very young. This is one of those things like, uh, if you watch old, uh, old as in like 20 years ago, uh, D Discovery channels and uh, History channel and all that, when they used to talk about science, they were always talk about like, you know, you could use a laser cutter to cut a very uh, thick steel, like on two to five millimeter. That was like a big deal back in that day. Like, whoa, laser cutting, five millimeter thick steel, whoa. But what happens if you had to cut to like, let's say, uh, inch thick steel or like, you know, 30 millimeter steel. At that point, they were like, dude, we had to use plasma cutter. That's why plasma cutters were like back, uh, backbone industry technology. However, after the development of fiber laser technology, once we started to pump kilowatts of it, then we reached a point where lasers can actually replace plasma cutters. Now that happened. Now same will go with this also. We just started this. We just are opening the doors and now we are like, huh, we can do things with it. So technology is still new, young, and is still maturing. That's why I specified the mathematical definition is not very clear. It's just like broadband, but you cannot just say broadband. It does not mean anything. You have to say a ratio as in like one to 10. Like if you have a deep hole, there is a mathematical ratio. The diameter would be one and the depth would be 10. If it's a one to 10, you will say it's a deep hole. If it's one, uh, one to 20, you will say very deep hole. Like there is a mathematical ratios to that. That's how you understand. Is it really deep or like just you're saying it's deep. So broadband also has that sort of uh, specification and is there in uh, all the wireless spectrum, but it's not there for this super continuum. So some people are like, oh, okay, they took a blue laser straight out to let's say a little bit green, but they're not going to red, but is it super continuum? Technically, yes, but we do not have a definition because be mindful, this is designed for ultraviolet also, designed for infrared also. So it's a very uh, maturing technology, like it's maturing right in front of our eyes. And there are many users that yet to be found. And yes, I know I accidentally copy pasted them again. I am sorry about that. And uh, it's just a young field. Like we do not even know what we can do with this. For example, this is one company that is working on making photonics using this puppy. That's significant. If we can figure out how to use white laser in photonics, uh, it could have some serious uh, benefits. Not uh, like how far it can go. I do expect it's still uh, cooking in the still in the kitchen, but uh, I do expect it to do some interesting things. And they are saying like on paper, on principle, uh, if we really crack this puppy, we should have some serious horsepower in terms of photonics. Photonics, uh, like we'll go from like uh, serial photonics to parallel photonics, so we can crunch. Photonics are already ludicrously fast. Like they, in terms of speed, they are super duper hyper fast. They work at terahertz. Uh, in terms of uh, size, they are back, bad. Because again, the wavelengths are so huge. It's freaking huge. The physical device would be huge. But if you can have the speed of light while having parallelization of this sort of light laser beam where you can have different colors, each color can be individually controlled. You could have like 15 channels, 24 channels, 30 channels on one light spectrum. Damn. That, that will go into dime territory. At that point in time, it's like your servers will literally go by, bye-bye silicon, bye-bye quantum computer, just go into photonics. 
So this field is very young and I would urge you to look into it. So this was my presentation on super continuum laser. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me your disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.